Time is going at a funny rate of consciousness currently in 2021. It feels like a million years since that stupid ice cream licking challenge took the internet by storm. People were going into supermarkets, picking up ice cream containers, opening them, licking them, and putting them back on shelves. Would it surprise you if I said that was only in 2019? The results grossed people out, but fortunately there were no fatalities. The same cannot be said of product tampering with Tylenol in the 1980s. This story could easily make you paranoid about consuming anything, but these are the risks we take every single day. So, here we go. Getting sick is always a burden, no matter who you are. It means you can't earn a wage, it means you can't do things you'd normally do in a day, plus depending on how severe your illness is, you may suffer some unwanted symptoms that make life a misery. However, what if the medication that was supposed to make you well again was the reason you ended up losing your life? Well, this was the reality for a number of young people in Chicago in 1982. These murders would be referred to as the Tylenol murders and would see several innocent people lose their lives. In 1982, Johnson & Johnson were one of the oldest and most trusted pharmaceutical companies in the world. So trusted were they that around this time, the brand was commonly associated with babies. So ingesting their medication as an adult felt safe and accessible by households, not just in America, but across the world. On September 29th, 12 year old Mary Kellerman woke up for a second day with a sore throat and a runny nose. Very common among school children who spread germs among themselves faster than, well, school children spreading germs. As a former sports coach, I can attest that I have never had as many colds and flus as I did when I was teaching, so Mary catching a bug was no big deal. Mary was one of those really sweet, responsible kids who other parents trusted to mind their little ones. She had built a great reputation for her little babysitting business. Mary was at that funny age in between childhood and being a teenager. She loved horseback riding and collected magazines and pictures for her bedroom walls. Mary had stayed home from school the day before with a cold. Eager to get back to school and see her friends, her dad offered her two extra strength Tylenol from a brand new bottle for the lingering symptoms. Tylenol was an over-the-counter drug commonly used to treat nausea, headaches, cold and flu from Johnson & Johnson. It's one of those pills pretty much everyone keeps in their medicine cupboard. There's probably one in your gaff right now, or if not, I bet you've taken one at some point in your life. Basically, this drug was like a medical cup of tea. You didn't think twice about taking one or giving one to a family member. Minutes after giving Mary the pills, her father heard the soft final thud of her falling to the floor. Mary was dead before paramedics could get her to the hospital. Across the city, 27-year-old father of two post office worker Adam Yanis was feeling under the weather and took a sick day from work. As lunchtime approached, Adam was starting to feel a bit better and made himself a snack, grabbing two extra strength Tylenol from a new bottle for dessert. Within minutes, poor Adam stumbled back into the kitchen and dropped dead. Upon receiving the devastating news, his family rushed over to the house. Stanley, Adam's younger brother, and his wife, Theresa, began the horrible task of trying to organise things you organise when someone dies, like sandwiches and making phone calls and other stressful stuff. Stanley asked Theresa to grab the bottle of Tylenol on the kitchen counter as his back was hurting, a chronic pain young Stanley had found recurring for a while. Theresa popped some too for good measure. She had a headache from the shock of it all. The couple soon collapsed together at the home. Stan died that day, Theresa two days later. There were three more young women who died in similar circumstances. Paula Jean Prince was a 35-year-old flight attendant who worked for United Airlines. On the day of her death, she had purchased Tylenol from Walgreens on her way home. She was found dead in her apartment and an open bottle of Tylenol was found on her bathroom counter. Paula's funeral was held in Omaha at the same time as the Janus family victims. 30-year-old Mary McFarland, a single mother working to raise two young sons, was working at her job in the Illinois Bell in Lombard when she felt a headache coming on. Mary took Tylenol in the back room of her workplace, walked back into the office and to the horror of her co-workers dropped to the floor and died. Yet another Mary, Mary Magdalene Rayner, was an Irish woman with a real passion for her family. 
She was happily married to her husband, Ed. They loved bowling together. She was a great cook and she even liked to rock out in the drums for fun. The couple had just welcomed their fourth child into the world. She used some Tylenol to relieve her post-birth discomfort and soon after, you guys have the pattern figured out here, she dropped dead, leaving husband Ed Reiner to mourn and four children to grow up without a mother. Autopsies were performed on the victims, a tenuous connection had already been established, and in Chicago, the sudden deaths of anyone under 40 always undergo further exploration. The results were shocking, with cyanide being found in all seven victims, but how did it get there? Well, police and detectives investigated further and connected the dots back to each victim having taken Tylenol. After the bottles in question were specifically tested, it was discovered that the capsules inside had been emptied of their contents and had been replaced with poison before being carefully placed back into their containers. It seemed a batch of this drug had been laced with the deadly compound known as potassium cyanide. Those who ingest this substance lose conscious quickly and take on a red complexion as their tissues aren't able to make use of the oxygen in the blood. Shortly after, the individual suffers from brain death and cerebral hypoxia, leading to the person losing their life. A terrible, sudden and gruesome fate indeed. After these deaths began being reported, the police were quick to try and put a stop to the issue. Initially, they believed that the problem was traceable to one supplier in particular, with the pharmaceutical company being host to the assailant. However, it quickly became clear that various companies had distributed the drugs and therefore this ruled out any tampering during production. Investigators concluded that the assailant was returning laced samples back onto supermarket shelves under the nose of retailers. The response to this was swift by Johnson & Johnson. In order to ensure that no more people were affected by the contaminated Tylenol batch in circulation, they issued a nationwide recall of all Tylenol, where approximately 31 million bottles were taken out of circulation. It is estimated that this cost the pharmaceutical industry around $265 million. Then, in addition to this, there was a nationwide media campaign to get the word out about this contaminated batch of Tylenol products. Flyers were strewn about the streets, announcers with megaphones patrolled the roads and ads were issued in various publications to inform the public of the danger that may be lurking in their own home. To this day, we still don't know who the culprit was behind this drug tampering tragedy. However, there were a number of people who were questioned in regards to this event. The first was a man named James William Lewis, who sent a ransom note to the major pharmaceutical company Johnson & Johnson asking for $1 million to drop these murders from happening. Lewis was sent away for 13 years for extortion, however the police were never able to categorically link Lewis to the murders. Some other people were considered as suspects, such as Roger Arnold for example, who was identified, investigated and cleared of the killings. Arnold later had a nervous breakdown due to the media attention, which he blamed on Marty Sinclair, a bar owner who had identified him. In the summer of 1983, Arnold shot and killed an unrelated man whom he mistook for Sinclair and who did not know Arnold. Roger Arnold was convicted in January 1984 and served 15 years of a 30-year sentence for second-degree murder. On a side note, it's wonderful how those half sentences turn out. He died in June 2008. Lori Dan, who poisoned and shot a number of people in a May 1988 rampage in Illinois, was briefly considered a suspect, but no direct connection was found. However, all these leads were cleared of any suspicion and the case eventually went cold. The only time this case was revisited was in 2011, when the forensics department decided to see if any advances in their sciences over the last 25 years would be able to crack the case. So with this in mind, they went after a man named Ted Kaczynski, otherwise known as the Unabomber. This man was responsible for a number of high-profile murders in Chicago within the period of the Tylenol murders, so the police tried to link the notorious killer to the drug tampering case. However, the police were again unable to link anyone to the murders and the case remains cold to this day. A lot of people believe that Lewis was indeed the culprit, but others believe that he was an evil opportunist looking to profit off the tragedy. The seven people who died in the initial drug tampering case wouldn't be the only people who suffered due to the Tylenol murders. Sadly, many killers tried to carry out a series of copycat cases, and more people were subjected to related deaths. One case, the murder of Bruce Nichol, was particularly dark, as he was killed by his own wife, who tried to pass it off as potassium cyanide poisoning, soon after the events of the initial tampering case. 
In total, it's reported that seven other people lost their lives due to the copycat murder cases. What's particularly interesting is that rather than sealing the fate of the pharmaceutical company Johnson & Johnson in the long term, it actually enhanced the trust in the brand. Some might cynically contribute this to an amazing set of public relations strategies, while others believe the company were genuine in their attempts to resolve the horrifying murders at their end at least, taking the hit of recalling the entirety of the possibly affected stock to the tune of millions of dollars. The efficacy of the product was never in question. Tylenol itself worked. The public had lost faith in the packaging, and so Johnson & Johnson upped their safety and quality control including the addition of tamper-proof packaging. This became the new pharmaceutical industry standard when new legislation that made tampering with pharmaceutical or food products a federal crime. Additionally, most capsules were replaced over time with caplets that prevented any swapping of substances. This terrible ordeal was a scary and unsettling one for Chicago and indeed the world as many were truly fearful of taking medication in the aftermath. It was a stressful time for all and we can thank our lucky stars that procedures are in place today of the highest order. Except for ice cream, of course. I'm really interested to hear in the comments if you think the murderer was caught. Until we speak again, sending you good vibes. Stay safe out there.